Yeah, good. Okay, great. Good, good, good. Okay. Well, I know many of you already submitted questions that you want to go over with dysautonomia. Dysautonomia is such a complicated and uh, confusing condition. So there, uh, there are just an endless amount of questions, and I'm really excited to go into those with you all today. If you have any questions you want to put in the chat, feel free. You can knock those out. In fact, if we actually do the first person to put a question there, I'm going to answer it right away. And while you're typing, I'm going to pull up the list of questions. Okay. So one of the questions is, how do I deal with chronic exhaustion, the very real chronic exhaustion? <laughs> okay, good, right now. Excellent, thanks guys. The chronic exhaustion with dysautonomia and with many of these nervous system conditions is really needs a different word, right? It's not it's not real uh, sleepiness or fatigue. It's it's very very extreme. It's it's on the cellular level. It uh, it really needs a better word to be able to describe it to loved ones and and others. Uh, it gets kind of written off as well. Everyone is tired, but it's it's very different. I. I would say that fatigue was the hardest thing for me to deal with. I, it's probably obvious with my life post remission, but my pre, pre remission life wasn't too different. I tend to put a lot into a day. I get very excited about lots of different projects and, and passions and hobbies. And so the, the fatigue was uh, really one of the biggest crippling things for me because when you're tired, nothing you do is fun. Maybe you love to paint before, but now it's not fun because it's exhausting. So, so with that, uh, I, I would say that was actually a huge, a huge struggle of mine, and one of the ones that uh, perhaps was the more self-destructive in the beginning. You know, where I would really uh, seek to doctors, just like, what can you give me? What can help? That kind of thing. But when I finally uh, kind of crossed a barrier, uh, the thing that really helped mentally uh, shifting was allowing myself to actually feel it. I realized I was constantly fighting the fatigue, really constantly fighting the fatigue. And, and there was a resistance there that gets built up. So one day I was listening to Eckhart Tolle. I love him. I love his audiobooks. And I was looking at trees and there's sunlight and I just allowed it. And I allowed the the exhaustion and the fatigue and and my energy to be exactly what it was authentic uh, real authentic like with with authenticity not uh, suppressing and trying to be different that actually opened up space for more energy i can't i don't know if i can put this into words but it it was visceral you could feel it uh, so i i think the the real acknowledgement and the re to yourself and the real acceptance of what these are and and allowing them rather than you know kind of pushing them down to try to get to this to-do list that has probably been there for five years you know uh that that is really what helped with the energy the most and for me now it's, it's different for everyone i work with so so take this with a grain of salt for me the fatigue was one of the last things to leave it did improve uh but not for the first i would say six months and uh, then just slightly at uh, the that's not too surprising once you start working with the body if we have any medical folks here that have worked with a lot of chronic illness that is not surprising because Anytime you're going towards regeneration, right, rebuilding the body, it takes an enormous amount of energy to do that. And when you're already very low in true energy in the body, mitochondrially, right, uh, you're going to be using anything that you newly generate to repair those cells. And the body's going to prioritize uh, the the healing of the cells rather than outward energy so that you can go, you know, live your life again after being so secluded. So so the fatigue is slow. And, and really, that's why I so often, uh, honestly, just all the time, I really emphasize the importance of cultivating mental grit, because this is a really long game. And it's not too intuitive. And, and the fatigue is, is definitely one of the harder things. But if you can allow it, that really helps. It helps with pain too, but there, there's other things with pain. Okay, 
Let's see, little joys. You're asking about the soup. Uh, okay, so when I did the soup diet for two years, did I add ferments or brines? A little bit. Yeah, so I, I did a lot of ferments before that because I was doing a, a ketogenic Weston A. Price. And, uh, and it wasn't specific, no starch, but it, it, was, uh, it was a good diet. And so I was doing a lot of ferments prior. I had a lot in my fridge. I certainly had, you know, I was making my own ghee for the diet. And, uh, and so I had some byproducts of, of dairy. And then also I did have sauerkraut, but I would do a little bit of brine of the juice is what I would do. So uh, so that would be in the, in the, in the soup bowl. It, to give you quantities though, it's really tiny. Uh, it would be like a quarter of a teaspoon to half a teaspoon because when you start shifting the microbiome, you could have eaten two cups of sauerkraut every day before you start a microbiome shifting protocol. But when you do, you suddenly have space in your microbiome. So a lot of these bacterial overgrowths have, have died off. So if you've ever played risk growing up, it's not too dissimilar. So now you have all this space. And when the probiotics come in, they can actually take over. They can, they can uh, come in and, and set up camp, right? And so they can, they can really cause a lot more upheaval. Not in a negative way per se, but you don't require as much. And if you have a lot, you could, you could definitely have some symptoms. So very, very little. Okay, let's see. Oh, you guys are asking great questions. All right. Uh, heal dysautonomia. Can you heal dysautonomia without ketosis? Absolutely. Yes. You can heal most things in many, many different ways. It's more about strategy. And so when I, you know, when I went into remission, Soon after that, there were three other people that did it, and they're pretty famous. One is Deliciously Ella. She's in the UK. She did a very different diet than I did, right? Uh, another was the, the low histamine chef, who's unfortunately passed away from a, a different condition. She got breast cancer. Uh, it's very sad. But I saw both of those uh, women and one other who's, who's not so famous go into remission on very different protocols that I had actually tried. And I mean, I don't, I didn't flippantly try for 30 days or 90 days. I, I really did do for a very long time. They made me much worse. I learned a lot from that experience. And that's why I've never been a practitioner who only teaches one diet. I really, I, I really modify them. Now there are certain conditions, uh, nervous system conditions would really be paramount where there's just slam dunks, you know, uh, most likely what most likely what benefited both Deliciously Ella and Low Histamine Chef was due to histamines being their primary cause, right? And I'm sure that's going to bring up a lot of questions and we can go into those. For me, I had I, I had histamine issues as well. Everyone does when you're sick. Uh, it's pretty hard not to, right? But, uh, but they weren't primary. They were more secondary from my bacteria and the bacterial shift in the body and overgrowth. So, so although it was very uncomfortable, and that's part of why my first six months were so difficult, you, you can actually see uh, the people that have the more difficult time when they start something that's going to work for them, they typically have a lot of histamines right? Because when we heal a new cell, we create histamines. And so if they're ha already having a problem processing them, their healing journey is going to be a bit more painful. It's going to be a steeper climb and less intuitive. Whereas someone else with the exact same condition could be handling those very well, and they just breeze into remission. It's part of why we see so much variety with people's healing stories uh, and something to always keep in mind and never feel like you can't because of this or that. It, it's really just that there are many things going on the body when you've got a chronic illness. It's not just one. And they all impact each other, but none inhibits getting better. The human body is really amazing at that. Okay, so, so when I work with clients, and especially with dysautonomia or MS or Parkinson's or uh, Alzheimer's, any, any really primary nervous system disorder, I love ketosis. One, the person is not hungry. Two, their nervous system and their uh, immune system, uh, both are being fed, both get fed by the saturated fat. So, so it's really addressing all these different things. And three, someone had asked in the questions how dysautonomia and anxiety were related. And my first initial response was uh, not at all, <laughs> really not at all. But actually, they are a bit. Uh, when you have 
uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, MS, a number of these conditions where there's pain involved, widespread, high lactic acid builds up. When we have high lactic acid in the body, it feels like we have a flu all the time. Now that's the body's response, right? That flu-like feeling. If the lactic acid is too high in the brain, it's a panic attack and anxiety. So for many of us, I'm sure, I'm sure many of you swore up and down to your doctors that you saw like, oh, I'm really not anxious. I'm not depressed. If I felt good, I'd be amazing. Uh, most, most people feel that way. Now it's the luck of the draw. Some people grew up with anxiety and then got this condition. So that would be different. But really the, the only uh, connection there would be the, uh, the, <laughs> the lactic acid. Uh, and I bring that up because uh, ketosis brings your lactic acid down so quickly. When you're eating carbohydrates and ferments, right? So there are timings to these things. Uh, things that are good for us are not blankets. They're not good all the time. They need to be brought in at the right time. And uh, wisely, you really need to use discernment, right? Which is difficult with brain fog, I know. <laughs> but give yourself some slack. So when we eat carbohydrates, we produce an enormous amount of lactic acid. So if our body's already too full, of lactic acid, we're going to get more, 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 and more symptoms. And so that's why uh, the carbohydrate base is more difficult, definitely. And then you also have the hunger, right? The tribes that I go to see all around the world, they have no food variety. So me eating that bowl of soup every day for two years would be normal in traditional societies. It's not normal here. And so you're going to be seeing all your friends and family eating your favorite foods and you're going to smell them and you're going to want them. And one of the benefits of ketosis is that when you are able to get there and when you've been there for a little while, a food is neither here nor there. You, you, you don't get pulled by it. And so it gives you more control and it lets you make better decisions. So there's a number of reasons for it. Oh, actually, I would give another as well. Uh, two more. Uh, another is that you're quite satiated. So you can go a very long time without eating and you're not hangry, right? If, if you've ever been one of those people or if one of your friends or family is one of those people that, that really uh, uh, gets very angry when they don't eat or they're moody, that kind of thing, that's, that's from your blood sugar. And when you're in ketosis, it's rock solid. Once you get there, there's a transitional phase, right? But there's always a price to pay, right? Almost like testing our commitment. But once you get there, then uh, you're very steady. So let's say you always eat lunch at noon and you have a doctor's visit and someone canceled and you're waiting in the office and four hours before they can get you in. You don't have food on you and you're on this medical diet. So you can't just like order takeout, Uber eats to the, <laughs> to the doctor's office. You're fine. You're totally fine to wait. And I don't mean fine through grit. You're fine. So it helps you make better decisions, which is really important. And then finally, because you can eventually, not in the beginning, you can eventually go longer without eating. So you could do a 16 hour uh, fast or an 18 hour fast each day, whatever it is, right? 20. Uh, it's quite dependent on you and where you are. During those 20 hours of the day that you're not eating and you're calm because you're not hungry and you're not having cravings, right? You're calm. Your body can go in and repair that nervous system that's within the gut lining because that's really needed in this condition, right? If we're continuously eating and snacking, which there's a time for, so we can, we can suss that out if anyone has questions about that. Uh, <laughs> when we're constantly snacking and, and eating, it slows down our migratory motor complex, this nervous system within the gut lining, which is 70% of our nervous system. It is no small, small thing, right? So if we can get on that, we can usually shift the needle for dysautonomia. But uh, if our body is busy digesting food, we're not going in and repairing the nervous system. And we don't want, I, I mean, I don't want to tell you what you want. What I wanted for myself and what I want for those uh, that I care about and those that I work with, my goal is always to get them to where it's not a medicine approach, even with food or with supplements, that if we pull out the technique that's used, they don't get sick again. That is my goal. And so that takes real repair 
of the body, right? Not just avoidance of something. And so, so those are the things that are so beneficial about ketosis. So uh, another person asked a uh, difference between the urine ketones and blood ketones. Yeah, I find, and maybe this isn't true anymore, but I know when I had my private practice open, when, so, and I saw all conditions uh, really, so <laughs> the whole gamut, but if someone came in and said they had done a ketogenic diet, I would immediately go and ask them, a barrage of questions because many people assume that if they don't eat carbohydrates, they're in ketosis, or if they use the urine strips and they're positive, that they're in ketosis. And, and that is not true. Neither are. Uh, I've seen many, many people on the carnivore diet for a year before I meet them, and they're not in ketosis. They're using that protein. They're converting it to carbs and using that for energy. So it is something that you have to test the blood for. I don't trust any other method. Uh, blood ketones and urine ketones, very different. If you're expelling urine ketones, you're either in transition, so you just started shifting, uh, you just reduced your carbohydrates, increased your, your fat, reduced your protein, whatever it might be, or you are not in ketosis because we only expel uh, ketones through the urine if we're not using them. And if ketones are a primary energy system, we are not expelling them, we're using them. So for myself, uh, let's say if I tested my blood, I'm probably around uh, anywhere from like a three to a six uh, blood ketone level right now. If I tested my urine, I should be negative, right? So I never use urine strips. I also don't, uh, I don't recommend the breath meters. There's some that are getting better. And if I have someone who passes out, if they see a needle, I'll use it, but it's not ideal. It's not ideal, okay. You guys are asking great questions. This is good. Uh, someone asked if I was going to do the recent uh, podcast questions today. Probably not today, but I, I will this week. Yeah. Okay. How to control hypoglycemia on, on uh, keto or just in general? Let's talk about that one. That's, that's a really important one because that's often a, a pretty disabling symptom in the beginning. Mm. One thing that I highly recommend if you can, and if it doesn't... <laughs> If it doesn't increase your anxiety. If you're if you're a data person, it can be really helpful to get a blood pressure cuff at home and a blood sugar monitor at home. What we often assume is low blood sugar. It could be low blood pressure. The, many of these things feel exactly the same. They feel awful, right? And they're relieved by eating. But it doesn't mean that we're right. It doesn't mean that that's actually what's going on. So I always check that out first. Now, the recommendation in, in you know, kind of the public sphere for the last couple of decades with hypoglycemia is that you need to eat more frequently. The problem with that, well, it's a benefit and a problem. Benefit is that will help you. It's a Band-Aid approach. It will make it worse long, long term, but it will help you right now. And right now is important too, right? So, so that's the thing. But if we spike our blood sugar, Every time we eat, which we do, even if you're eating a, a ketogenic snack, you will be spiking your blood sugar. So every time you, you spike your blood sugar, you're setting yourself up for more of a dip later. And that's part of why eating less is more helpful over time, but it, it's not somewhere you can just jump to, right? It, it's something that you have to kind of tiptoe to. So if you're used to eating every two hours, every three hours, whatever it might be, just start reducing the carbohydrates in those meals. Typically, once you get to, say, 20, 30 carbohydrates a day, you can take as long as you need to for that, but it needs to be very steady. Then you can usually go down to breakfast, lunch, dinner and have no problem. And you know, you know if that's the case. You can have a snack on you and, and moderate if needed. But I, I've seen it work over and over and over again, uh, people that really would end up in the hospital if they didn't eat every two two hours and now can do 72 hour fasts. So, so it's something that you take time with. And I, I would say one of the biggest things uh, with this condition is consistency. It's really consistency in any action you decide to bring in because the, the very beast of the condition is the opposite, right? And so we've typically lost a lot of uh, trust and respect for our bodies with this, and, and rightly so, that's a rational response. But we have to regain that. And I don't know if you, maybe you all are better than I, but what I would often do is, uh, if I felt any better at all, I would make a big leap and then pay for it for weeks, and then a leap and then pay for it for months. And so what I ended up finding was if, if I just really, I mean, humbled, right? I mean, we've been humbled enough, right? 
do we have to humble again? But it really does help. So, so just really humbled myself enough to do micro things that I really could do every day and build that in and then bring a new one in. It really built confidence and it really helped to get me to my goal. Now, what I can say as a practitioner now, you know, uh, working with thousands of people, consistency is the thing that gets people better, consistency and patience. So, so with whatever you decide to bring in, uh, always, always make that the goal. And, and that would be the same with, with something like this. So if you're transitioning from, okay, you're, you're a frequent snacker, you're going to consistently bring the carbs down to the same amount, right? Okay. All right. So that was hypoglycemia. That'll regulate it. Uh, it's really a condition that came out of snacking, actually. It was caused by snacking. It's ironic. It's a big story. Okay. With respect to fasting, do you advocate a constant schedule or a cyclic, depending on women's cycle? I recommend uh, a consistent schedule. One of the things that we really want to do with dysautonomia and other nervous system conditions is reinform the body of the circadian rhythm, right? Uh, the very nature of having an imbalanced nervous system means we're not doing anything at the right time. You eat a meal, your blood go to your feet instead of your digestion. You are exhausted all day and so sleepy and you can't wake up and then you lay down to go to bed and now you're awake right? Your circadian is off. Your serotonin is off. Your hormones are off. Literally everything, right? You're breathing too. You all know you're in it. So, so what we really have to do is reinform the circadian rhythm. And that requires very, very rigid habits. Our, our bodies relax uh, a great deal when they know what to expect. So if they know that you eat at noon and you wake up at a certain time, they, the body will start producing the right hormones and chemicals and help you, right? And so we have to force that. And if you all are anything like me, I needed outside help. I could not get myself awake. <laughs> so embarrassing. Uh, it felt like a character flaw, but, but it's really your brain is in deep sleep or not deep sleep, light sleep, but you know, you know what I mean. Okay. Okay, uh, Sam is asking about the difference between proteinuria and oxalates, everything. Everything is different. Proteinuria is protein in your urine. That's an indication that your, your kidneys are struggling a bit. It depends on the number for, so the, the scale of the, uh, the lab test as to, as to how much the, the kidneys are struggling or working, but it, just totally different things. You can have very high oxalates or very high oxalate dumping without having proteinuria. They're, they're just different things. Let's see. Okay, sorry, scrolling through. So, okay, little Joyce is asking about, uh, her son is having severe regurgitation of food and is negative for H. pylori. What do you think it could be? Well, let me, let's talk about H. pylori a little bit, right? Because we'll probably, I bet you all are curious about H. pylori, MTHFR, uh, some of these things that we kind of see across the board. H. pylori is not our enemy. It can be very protective. It's not something to just kill off. The issue is not the H. pylori. The issue is where it is in the body. So there's no question H. pylori likes to change the stomach acid. It does. That's true. But it only does that if you don't have integrity in your gut lining. So your gut lining on the fingers, the villi, uh, the, the H. pylori should be at the tip if you've got a good microbiome and a good nervous system there. Now, most of us are going to have huge crevices instead, and our little villi are going to look like this, like a little dystopian coral reef, if you can imagine that. And they come in here. And when H. pylori goes down here into the crevice, that's where you get the problems with it. But it's not something to just kill. It's actually very protective. And in, in my tribal work, actually, we've seen it to be incredibly protective. If uh, a group of people doesn't have it, there's more problem. Now, that's it. Uh, question on regurgitation. Most of that is typically from the blood being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So we're not producing the digestive enzymes like a normal person would when they eat, right? Uh, right now, if I were to eat some kind of carb, say a fruit or, or like French bread, out of my salivatory gland, I would produce an enzyme called amylase, which breaks down carbohydrates. If I still had dysautonomia, 
I'd be very lucky if that happens because my body wouldn't even likely register that I was actually eating. And so the stomach acid wouldn't increase. I wouldn't get the amylase. And so that's where you can get a lot of the digestive issues, right? But most of those things, as difficult and as uncomfortable as they are, are a bit of red herrings. So you can chase them down. You can get 18 diagnoses. They're, diagnoses, they're all valid. They're all real. But the real core of it is the imbalance in the nervous system. You get at that you fix the rest. So, so with that kind of regurgitation, what I really recommend, and nausea, I bet a lot of you have a lot of nausea, is you want to be very relaxed when you eat. You need to eat at the same time. Highly recommend you do classical music. If you're, if you're anything like me, especially in the later stages where it was really much worse, I was relying on, uh, before I figured any of this out, I was relying on distraction. It would take me sometimes three hours to eat as something small, like a piece of, uh, you know, almond toast with banana and honey, <laughs> you know, something small. <laughs> and it could take me hours. And so I would distract myself with a movie. And that was the only way I could get food down. If you're dealing with something like that, the best thing is to set the routine and then be patient. It really does take quite a bit of time. So it's not gonna be like the TV commercials where you take a Tylenol and then you feel better the next day. It's not like that. So instead, it's really more of getting at the underlying systems. So I recommend feeling very grateful before you eat. You can go about that anyway. You can think about how the food got to your table. You can think about your organs that are working right, right? It really helps to focus on what is working right in the body. I'm sure it feels like nothing is. And, uh, and classical music, things that calm the nervous system. A great trick if your son isn't too young is to breathe through the left nostril. So if you just have normal breaths through the left nostril for five to 10 minutes, that will activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is where we go into the digestive mode. So, uh, you know, we are very sympathetic dominant in this group, and that's the real hurdle. So activating that before you eat and before you sleep through left nostril breathing is very, very helpful. And again, don't think of it like Tylenol. Use that as a habit to build the nervous system will kick in. Okay. All right. Ooh, how did I deal with the emotional roller coaster while healing? Not well. <laughs> I didn't handle it well. I really didn't. I uh, definitely didn't, especially not for the first few years. I, I'd like to think it was because I was a, you know, a teenager and then early 20s, but I don't think it matters when this happens. It's, it's a hard thing to deal with. And I, I used to even tell people and tell my doctors, I was like, I am not the right personality for this. I am not a homebody. I don't want to sit at home reading books. <laughs> you know, I wanted to be in Africa. It was, it was a huge problem, I would say. Now, you know, the, the pain of the neuropathy kind of it gave me a really beautiful gift at a certain point where the emotional turmoil and, and pain and difficulty and isolation and all of that, I kind of just, it was like popping into this, still this reality, but I could see all the beauty. And I, I really went into a real state of gratitude. And I would say probably a great deal of the things that I had started implementing when I was bed bound were really helpful that we know about now. I, I didn't know about the limbic system then, you know, and these things, but I was actually training it every day. I just didn't know after year seven, we should put a big clarify because I didn't handle it well before that. But working on my gratitude journal every day, focusing on what was right, focusing on my loved ones and what was good was very helpful because I, I think it's, it's really hard uh, for you all. You won't be understood by anyone, as you know, right? And you'll crave that. You'll crave that validation. And it's a rare bird that gets it. And so it can really put a division between you and your loved ones. I don't know how it couldn't. And realistically, I mean, I even think it now, I, I really believe this. I, I don't think if anyone has not been through something like this or something significant and long-term where they could not change the, uh, 
they couldn't change the factors, you know, they didn't have control. I don't know how they could understand, really, you know. And so as painful as the things can be that are done and said, uh, it's not it's not with malintent. And I, I know it's really hard to, I don't want you to just like be a bigger person for being a bigger person. It's not that, it's actually uh, the practicing, the focusing on what's going right, the gratitude journal really shifts your neurochemistry, but it also creates ridiculously beautiful relationships, like really good. And the most important one being with yourself, right? When you're sick with this, when you're in bed or wheelchair, wherever you are, it's like being on a plane to India, right? You can show up to that plane with no downloaded movies, no books, no snacks, no eye cover, nothing. You'll have a terrible time, right? You'll come out ragged and exhausted and angry and never wanting to fly again. Uh, or you can come with preparation. It's the same journey, but the experience is very different. And that, that was really my take home from uh, that kind of shift in those later years of being bed bound, of uh, it, it shifting the internal world even before the symptoms go away. It makes a massive difference, a massive difference. Okay, so once I did that, I, I didn't have the emotional roller coaster anymore. I actually didn't care if I healed, it sounds strange, I know. Okay. Why can CFS take so long sometimes? Oh, I will tell you, <laughs> you know, I don't typically talk about this stuff at dinner parties and things, but if someone knows what I do, they'll start asking what conditions I work with. And, you know, they'll ask about things like cancer and MS and, and the conditions I would say that the public is rightfully afraid of, right? These kind of uh, very dire and doomsday and very sad and quick. Uh, or very disabling conditions, right? Those, in my experience, are the fastest to recover. It's almost like a, a bad joke that things like Lyme, CFS, uh, dysautonomia, not all cases, but many, I was one, uh, really take a very long time. Like we're talking like one to three years, you know? Uh, it's a very long time. Why do I think that's the case? With chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, I know it's considered a waste bucket diagnosis, but it really is not. There are so many biomarkers for it. Same with fibromyalgia. You can look on a brain scan of someone with fibromyalgia. Their sleeping scan is wildly different than other people. The nervous system is very different. The microbiome is very different. The lactic acid levels are through the roof. There are all of these markers, right? There's no deep sleep happening. They're staying in light sleep, which is how we torture people right? And don't people with CFS feel tortured? It's accurate. It's an accurate feeling. So why does it take so long? Because it's not one thing. It's not just like, we can't just cut off the, the sugar source, right? Uh, take diabetes. We think of diabetes as nothing, right? It's so, it's so common. If you're a practitioner, you don't because you see, and I see, the people that go blind, amputees, and then death. Very, very awful condition. We just think you can manage it, right? The It's so easy. It's like two to six weeks to get out of that, right? Because it's a, an issue of regulating the blood glucose hormones and the blood, the blood glucose. That's it. it. It's very simple. So there are conditions that are more simple and those that are more myriad. And CFS is really more myriad. I, I used to think of it like the the honeybees, bee disease that we're seeing, you know, the, the honeybees that were dying all over the world, but especially in the States had, had so many factors when they're dissected. They'll have a number of viruses and bacteria and parasites. And, and I should say with that, that in us, we will have all of those, right? We have a virome that I, I really never go into publicly, but it's 37,000 times bigger than the microbiome, all right? So we need, we are viruses. We are parasites, we are bacteria. These things are not foreign. When they have overgrown, it is an issue with the surrounding Petri dish. That's the problem. Just like with H. pylori, it's either in the wrong place or the population is too high or too small. The killing routine that we've been doing has been understandable 
but also naive. Uh, a lot of what's coming out, are you all familiar with L-form bacteria? It's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. When, let's say I have strep, I'm seven. I'm seven years old, I have strep. Uh, doctor gives me antibiotics, right? That kills the strep, doesn't it? That's what we've been told. It doesn't. It changes it to an L-form bacteria, which is where we see its correlation, but it's, it's a pretty deep correlation, chronic disease states. Okay. Now you take an L-form bacteria, how do you get it back to the normal form? It's all the things we write off as not important. It is sunshine on your skin and in the eyes. It is swimming in the ocean. It's certain kinds of saunas. I'm sure there's many other things, but those are the things that have been studied to take an L form back. And that's part of why I'm in the ocean so much. Whenever I see an ocean, I jump in. Uh, I, want, I want that all over my skin, right? So we, we, want, uh, we don't wanna make them enemies, actually. We wanna bring harmony is what we wanna do. Okay. Oh, my favorite snack. Well, I don't snack very often, you know, uh, but I'm in America at this very moment for this day. And my favorite snack is here. Yeah, my favorite snack is here. It's the green plantain chips cooked in tallow with so much sea salt. I love those. I would not have eaten those while I was healing, not because they're not good for you. They're perfectly fine, but they, they prevent the shifting of the microbiome, so they're not appropriate. Now, uh, now, before, I would say probably roasted chicken skin would be another one. Yeah, but I, I'm very much not in a, a snack culture, really. Okay. Uh, Maximus is asking about IV infusions to help heal from recurrent infections and viruses. Would vitamin D injections be okay if they're not rising? So vitamin D is actually very hard to get up. Uh, you all may have seen this and hopefully you're not all experiencing that. But vitamin D really isn't a vitamin. It's something we're supposed to make. There's a lot of things that come into play. It's uh, You have to have a lot of cholesterol in your diet, for one. You have to get a lot of sun on your skin and in your eyes, for another, in order to make that vitamin D. You can also eat it through certain foods, like egg yolks. Two egg yolks a day have the right amount of ADK. Uh, certain times of the year, fall and spring, uh, the grass-fed butter, it's going to look more orange. That is very good for that. So, so there's ways to get it. But yeah, if you don't see numbers, it, you could consider doing IVs. I'm, I'm always hesitant to recommend anything that's, uh, that's injected simply because it's, it's not as short-lived typically. It doesn't have the same kind of half-life as taking something orally. Uh, and because I work with you know, the, the island of lost toys types, right? I don't work with the average bears, the normal folks. I've, I see a lot of the adverse reactions and, and really adverse reactions with dysautonomia are very, very normal. I bet there's many people in here that if you take an upper, you fall asleep. And if you take a sleep medicine or you listen to a CD that's made for the right kind of wavelength for going into deep sleep, you wake up. It, it's very common to have those adverse reactions when you have a nervous system disorder. So I'm just always cautious of it. But if you've historically done great with infusions, then that would be a way to go. Just know that vitamin D does require A and K as well. And the A needs to be from animal. So that's A palmitate, which is not in very many supplements. There's uh, Da Vinci, the supplement on Amazon is a really good one and also cheap. It's the right ratio of ADK. When we take vitamin D by itself long term, we actually set ourselves up for, for welcoming more cancer cells. So it's fine to do, I would say, for under six months, high dose or individual. But do be mindful of that. Uh, nature is very, very beautiful. We don't fully know it. I don't know that we ever will. You know, we're, we'll always discover new things which is why it can be really helpful to do things through food because that's already a done deal, right? There's things in that food that we don't know yet. And there's things in your body that we don't know yet and they work. Whereas when we isolate and we pull them out, we can get into a bit of trouble like that, right? So you take a lot of vitamin D, you get a vitamin A deficiency and that is like a welcome mat to cancer cells, which we all have in our body at all times, uh, but then it can allow it to overgrow. So short-term, yes. 
Okay. Let's see. Uh, best diet for RA. Rheumatoid arthritis, really what I see work the best is to slowly, elim slowly and I mean it, eliminate oxalates, uh, eliminate lectins. Lectins and oxalates are two plant toxins that are really a huge problem for RA. That would include saponins, the whole nightshade family as well. But uh, many people with arthritis will pull out nightshades for 30 days and think, oh, I, I didn't see a benefit, so who, who cares? And had I been a younger practitioner before I saw a lot of people <laughs> heal and not heal and what works and what doesn't, I would have said, yeah, that makes sense. But uh, no because the fat soluble toxins that are in those plants last for 90 days. So, so you really need more time to assess. And honestly, you don't need to assess, right? Uh, we want to get away from looking at, I do this and then I have this symptom. I do this and then this should get better. No, no, no. That is how we go down the rabbit hole and we never come out, right? You want to think strategically for RA, immune system, joints, focus on those two only. Dysautonomia, you focus on nervous system only, right? And so all the other things fall by the wayside. So you're not looking at day-to-day -day symptoms. Day-to-day -day symptoms will, will keep you in a, a purgatory. Okay, I do use ketosis for that too, but it's not required. Let's see. The thing, uh, going back, Maximus, to reoccurring inf infections, if you can balance your blood sugar, so if that takes going low carb or ketogenic, whatever it is for you, but like real steady, like 84, you'll have a lot less infections. Definitely look at your cholesterol levels. If your cholesterol is low, you won't be able to fight off infections. So we really do not want low cholesterol, right? It's our, our immunity. And the thing that I've seen work the best are glyconutrients. Uh, these are foods that you can have just in your diet. You don't have to go out and buy something. Uh, the thing that I took was Ambrotose, which is like a pyramid company. So that's why I've never promoted it. But there's lots of companies that make similar products and, uh, and have the same ingredients. But really, it's the eight different glyconutrients that regulate the immune system. And they're found in traditional foods. I see them everywhere I go. So if you're on a on a carnivore diet or whatever diet you're on, you find them. Uh, carnivore is going to be in shrimp shells and in bone marrow and in whey. And on other diets, like the one I did, uh, uh, garlic and onions and uh, and bone marrow too, yes? So so you get them through all these different areas. But those, those are very helpful, really very helpful. Uh, they're often called lectin blockers as well because they happen to do that as well. Okay, Zach Cole. Oh, these are good questions. Okay, let's see. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I, I think parasites are undertreated. I really do. I um, Most of the countries that I go to, and, and Dr. Zach, I'm not sure where you're based, but most of the countries that I go to, prescription antiparasitics are over the counter. And in the States, I've had clients, especially when I lived in Oregon, everyone just wanted to prescribe them antibiotics, even if they had they had tested positive for significant parasites after traveling, antibiotics rather than antiparasitics. And maybe you could clue us in. I, I don't know why that is, why it's so taboo, or perhaps it's that we assume that we don't have them. But parasites are everywhere. And, and they are an issue. They can be our best friend. They can really help us in a lot of ways, right? Our mitochondria used to be parasites a long time ago. Um, not now, it's not literal, uh, but they were a long time ago. But I, I've seen huge differences when people treat parasites. Now, I will say this though. I am, I, as far as like going against a, a virus, like an anti-protocol virus, uh, parasite, bacteria, we do have to do that sometimes. Like that, that can be really needed. But the person has to be strong enough. You have to have that foundation of health in order for that to take hold. So what I've found, and I'm sure you all have seen it, you've seen those Lyme clinics. They're very, very sad. People walking around with IVs, they look like AIDS patients, right? Uh, you kill, 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 kill. You don't have the strength to keep anything that remains away. The immunity is really important. So when I'm working with someone, let's say they come in and they have Lyme co-infections co and, and all sorts of things. I've, I've often lived in high Lyme areas, so I, I tend to see a lot of it. And the, 
you know, they've done a lot of the kill, kill approaches, the IV antibiotics, they've done the herbal, they've done these things. What I really find is it's actually the combination of a number of things. We have to bring in the lifestyle, mindset plus diet, wait three to six months. I prefer six. At six months, we test again. If they're still testing positive, which honestly a small portion do, it's not many. Uh, if they're still testing positive, then we treat. And very often the very same herbal protocols that they used before that did not work, now they work because their body's strong enough. They have their immunity and they have the other things in place. It's very, very easy uh, and human to write off so many things that we try as I have done everything. When what I've seen, and take away the grain of salt, it's what I've seen, I'm sure there's other perspectives. It's the combination. It's are the right pieces in at the right time and are they being done at the right time? And, and, and the combos. So so yes, definitely, I've seen wonderful things. I mean, I'm in love with Wormwood. I don't know, but I think Wormwood is amazing. Uh, and it's very good. And I take antiparasitics when I travel to uh, regions, especially like when I was in Ethiopia this year, like very, not everywhere I go, but if there, there's a lot of outbreaks, yes, in, in a number of things, yes. And I, I wish Americans had more access, honestly. Okay. Uh, choline, Derek, great question. Okay, so Derek says, I mentioned uh, choline found in abundance in, in brains. So when I go to the tribes, uh, brain is typically, it doesn't matter what uh, diet the tribe eats, really, across the board, they tend to love brain. Uh, and it's understandable. It tastes a bit like custard if it's done right. It's very, very good. But more than that, it has all of these things that are very good for the cell membrane. And I, I know the cell membrane isn't like sexy. It's not talked about on YouTube, you know, uh, maybe plant toxins and these kind of things, but not, not the cell membrane. But the cell membrane is really your ticket to getting better. And choline is very helpful for that, uh, phosphatidylcholine. So brain is very high, uh, 100 grams of brain serving. I know you guys are like, okay, I'm out. I'm never eating brain. It's okay. Uh, 100 gram portion of consuming brain from an animal is equivalent to six capsules of taking a PS100 supplement or phosphatidylserine. I I had to always use this in my practice, sometimes topically, you know, someone was asking about vitamin D earlier and, and should I do IV? With this condition, going through the skin is a really good idea for nutrients that are not responding. So let's say you've been taking a nutrient and it's not improving your cellular level or, or your serum, depending on what you're testing. The, the skin is a very viable organ that can be used, right? Because our digestion requires the blood flow to go there. And we're not doing that. We're not sending the blood at the right time. And so we are digesting some things, we would be dead otherwise, right? But we're not digesting well. And so the absorption rate is not going to be high. Now, phosphatoserine, it's an oil. And as such, you can get it through your skin. You can actually just put it on thin areas of your skin, like your inside of your elbow. And if you add something, uh, and this does not need to be done. So brain fog, just turn the next sentence off. But if you add something like DMSO, which is a, a it brings, it's from pine needles and it's used in hospitals, but it, it brings things from the skin into the blood very quickly in layman speak. And uh, you can really, you can get a lot of benefit from that. So I would do that. I wouldn't do that with the B vitamins, but I would do that with any fatty right? So uh, vitamin D, you could do that with, uh, and definitely phosphatidylcholine. And I, I had always used that because it really helps to, you know, nothing, nothing is a silver bullet for the immense sleep and fatigue issues, right? But I'm sure you all have noticed if you even get 2% better, it's exciting in any area. <laughs> it's very exciting. And what phosphatidylserine can do is dip your cortisol levels at night. And so what we see, the, the sleep patterns and the cortisol patterns with people with dysautonomia and most nervous system disorders is that cortisol goes very high when you're supposed to be sleeping and it's very low during the day. Now, this can make us feel like cortisol is our enemy. It is not our enemy, okay? Cortisol is good. It's like the H. pylori. It's just confused. It's confused is what it is. We need it in the morning, right? If we want to pop out of bed, if we want that delicious feeling of being rested and pop out of bed and not needing caffeine or, or, you know, 
two hours to sit in bed getting the gusto to move. We need cortisol. That's when it should be produced is in the morning, right? But you all are going to have it at night. And so if you sleep, you're going to have very light sleep phases, uh, meaning that there's four stages of sleep and they're deeply misunderstood. The more you can start to learn about these, the, the faster you'll get to where you need to go. Because uh, people with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, dysautonomia, most of the people I've, I've worked with with MS, but it's not across the board. It depends on the level of disability with that one. Producing cortisol all through the night, whether they're sleeping or not. Now, this will produce a lot of the symptoms you probably don't like, like waking up with the racing heartbeat, that sudden like <gasps> that, that's your cortisol, that's your sympathetic nervous system active at night when it should not be. We need our parasympathetic through the night. Uh, what that means is it's going to keep you in stage one and two of sleep. Stage one and two of sleep, you may sleep for 14 hours or 12 hours, but you wake up less rested than you were before you went in. And typically you're going to have very heavy dreams that you kind of can't take off of you. You know, the, the emotional imprints, the visual imprints are on you all day. They're heavy, right? If you all know what I'm saying, let me know. Uh, that is, that's an indication that we're seeing in one and two of sleep, not going into three and four, and that cortisol is going to be an issue. So with this, anything that starts to promote parasympathetic balance at night is going to benefit. We're not going to get it just with a supplement, really. It's going to take an entire approach. Uh, it's going to have to be <laughs> lifestyle, diet, supplements, and patience. But when you find it, you'll find that it's worth it. So for instance, my, my evening routine was between two to four hours, depending on what year it was, right? And I had a whole barrage of things that I would do in the same order and supplements and things like this. But the, the most important one for me was that PS100, definitely. Um, and I, I want to be clear, it is not a, it's not a bullet. So if you take it and after five days, you're like, yeah, I don't really feel different. Give it more time and also don't expect so much. <laughs> really don't expect so much <laughs> because it's really about retraining. We have to retrain the body. Uh, you can use it through the day. So if someone has anxiety, that's very helpful during the day, but otherwise I don't use it that way. Okay. Uh, Rikudo is asking about the cause of MS. Well, I'll tell you what I see. Uh, I see a lot of MS reversing uh, simply with ketosis and very high B1 therapy, very high, and fat-soluble B1. I, I think B1 is very, very involved. I know all the theories of parasites and this and that and this and that, but one of the best things to do, I, I don't know, maybe that's just the way I think, I don't know, but in my opinion, do it all, right? If you're doing a microbiome-shifting diet, that's going to shore up your immunity and help you against anything like parasites, right? That's one of the theories. Uh, if you're doing very high dose B1, that's going to help you remyelinate the nerves and produce that mitochondria. And if you're in ketosis, well, we have thousands upon thousands of people who've gone into ketosis with MS. So, so you, you cover all your bases. You do them all at once. Why wouldn't we, right? You can start them in progressions that you can see what's working and what's not. But in general, throw the kitchen sink at it. Yeah, I, I think it's primarily B1. Okay. Uh, LD is asking, it sounds like you have a very severe POTS. I can hear that. Okay. Sorry guys, I lost the thread, give me two seconds. Okay, thoughts on liquid IVs. It's fine. I did them. I, honestly, with POTS, we're not digesting a lot of food. So if you're able to get nutrition through IVs, do it through IVs in addition. Uh, but my motive operandus is that it's fine. We can do the medications. We can do the IVs. We can do these things. And at the same time, we can use them like a crutch, like we have a broken leg right? So we're acknowledging there's nothing wrong with taking the medicines. If I was sick, I would do that again, right? And I might do the IVs. But I would be doing everything in my power that I could be responsible for to get myself better. Just like you wouldn't break a leg and then sit in bed for two years thinking it would just heal on its own, right? A time or a scientist in a lab. Same, same concept. So perfectly fine with them. 
yeah, I'm perfectly fine with them, especially if you see benefit. Okay. Uh, Nikki is waking with panic attacks. Oh, and Anne asked a really good one about, uh, there are many different forms of, of POTS and they present differently with the adrenal glands and how they're affected. So, you know, the adrenal receptors on the nervous system is kind of the hot ticket area for dysautonomia. That's where primarily most of the problems really are. And, uh, and so because of that, there are multiple forms and they present with opposites. The blood pressure will be very different. The adrenal hormones will be very different, all of that. But even though they're they're quite different in the in the medical stance, like when you go to your doctor, they're going to have different medications, right? They may not want to do the beta blockers and these kind of things. It's a different protocol. But with what what I do and what I what I recommend, it doesn't make a big difference, honestly. It really doesn't. Um, so I haven't seen uh, the different forms need need different things because we're not artificially raising, lowering blood pressure, uh, raising, lowering, lowering cortisol, those kind of things. We're really more bringing harmony is what it is. Okay, <clears throat> Nikki, you are waking in the morning with the feeling of a panic attack. What can you do? Okay, so when you wake in the morning, I'm guessing you would have that breathlessness and the heart racing. That is typically from a pH being off in the blood, lactic acid, being very high and the imbalance in the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So that's not abnormal, honestly. That can take uh, definitely another three months or so. But I would look at the sleep hygiene, not the way everyone talks about it online, but really for nervous system disorders. Like, are we turning out all lights after sunset? Are we going to only red lights and candlelight? Are we not reading? Are we not watching TV? after sunset? Are we uh, doing a gratitude journal before bed so that our cortisol comes down or utilizing something like EFT, right? There's all sorts of techniques that we don't know if they work, but we do know some things about them. So for instance, if you all are familiar with, with the tapping technique, emotional freedom technique, I learned about it in my undergrad uh, for, for international conflict management, very unrelated, but we went into PTSD and it was the only method that had been studied to work for PTSD, it lowered cortisol levels 20% over the course of a month. There were no drugs at the time that could do that. I don't know that there are now. Uh, maybe there are, we'd, we'd have to ask a pharmacist, but it's remarkable, right? So you take that information, anytime you get information like that, you implement it. Who cares if emotional freedom technique works for a phobia? It's gonna work at lowering your cortisol at night. If you lower your cortisol at night, you'll go into parasympathetic mode and you'll get deep sleep. And you know where the body heals? Deep sleep. So you could bring in EFT for 20 minutes at night, right? It's really more about the things. And try not to think of the timeline so much, right? Three months, six months, nine months, these kind of things. You've been sick for a long time. And to be frank, when we get sick, it's because we're already weak. We've just been walking on a cliff and we've been lucky so far. Nothing has blown us over. So uh, our entire lifestyle now, from the chair that I sit on, to the lights that are shining on me, to the way that we are communicating instead of being in person, none of that is good for human health, right? So when we feel like we've done a lot because we've changed our diet and our lifestyle, we still have an onslaught of things going against us. So patience is very important. And what I would do is really sit down with yourself, sit down with kind of like your checklist for the day and just make sure that you're being fully accountable to yourself. It doesn't need to be to anyone else. Like, is there anywhere that I could improve? Are any of these areas my weak spot? Like, let's say you guys probably know I kept this massive, I had this math notebook. So I did this graph and every day I would chart everything from uh, what time I woke up to everything, uh, organs consumed and, and all the things. But I did that for accountability because it's really easy to feel like we're doing everything because we do so much more to get better than other people, right? Uh, but when you really look at it, maybe you're doing it like three days a week 
or five days a week. Or maybe you just don't do this one recommendation because you thought it was silly, right? Or uh, you've read about this thing, but you haven't implemented it. So, so those things, uh, go back, look at that, and then bring those in with zero guilt or shame uh, and a lot of self-love. Okay. So for the, uh, just to say at the end though, Nikki, the, that feeling, the PS100 can be really helpful for, there's a cream that has it. Apex Energetics makes it with, yeah, it's called Adrenal Cream. You can find it. It's very nice. You can do that for, for those. But also remember, these are not deadly symptoms. Although they're very uncomfortable, you got to keep your eye on the prize. Okay. All right. <laughs> right, Sam? It's true. We have been humbled enough. <sighs> oh, Blue Sky, great job. Really great job. Carnivore is amazing for that. So at, at six months, you can try some of the some of the protocols. Oh, uh, someone's asking, what's my take on Lugol's? Well, it depends on what way. I, I like to have Lugol's for the skin, especially if you're a swimmer. It, deep, it displaces chlorine, which is a, a problem in most of the cells. But I typically, internally, I tend to go more um, for iodorol. Honestly, I, I like to know the right amount. I'm, I'm a pretty precise person. And with droppers, it's not always as precise. So internally, I tend to go more, more uh, in that route. But both are okay. Really, like uh, one some of the practitioners I respect most just use Lugol's, so it's not it's not a bad one. Christine is asking about thiamine. All right, all right. So, question is: thiamine deficiencies. Why do we have chronic issues with this as a large across many populations and what is the best method of addressing it? We have a number of factors against us right now that are not intentional, right? They're, they're kind of just like human error, <laughs> like us silly humans and what we've done. So we consume a number of foods in our diet that we consider healthy whole foods that bind to thiamine in our body and pull it out. Now, thiamine you need for remyelination, you need it for processing oxalates, you need it for energy, you need it for so many things, and uh, and keeping lactic acid down so you're not sore. So, so it's very, very important. And this thiamine is not in most of our foods. It's just not. Uh, it's primarily in foods like pork, and you would have to eat two cups a day. And so most of us have, have been raised with already high caloric malnutrition, meaning that we have a lot of calories. We might even be chubby or fat or obese, but we're malnourished on the cellular level. And B1 is a really, really big one. And, and this is very important for those of you with post-viral. I don't know if I can even say the word. Am I allowed to say the word? I don't know. But with post-viral, because many of the very significant conditions that have come out recently, uh, infections, are, are the damage is not from the infection, it's from the cytokines. And B1 controls cytokines. It keeps them from going out of whack. Right. So any loved one, as soon as, you know, the world shut down and there was this big virus, I sent everyone benfothiamine and I, I insisted on it. And I try not to force this stuff on family and friends. You really can't. Right. It's not very polite. Uh, but in that instance, I did. Yeah. For that. So I knew they weren't going to do like extreme things, maybe. Well, I don't know. But, you know, I'd, I didn't want to put that on them. But at the very least, we could control the cytokines where the, the significant life-threatening damage happens and also nervous system damage happens too. Okay. Ah, this is a good question. Okay. If someone with this condition goes into remission, have I seen people fall ill again? And what are the most common reasons? Rarely, yes, it's not common. And it is one of the reasons why when I give my so I give a big packet. Ever since I first started as a practitioner, I didn't know how long I'd have the person. And so I gave them all the information on the first day, <laughs> right? Everything I could put together for them. So they had a roadmap. And I, I still do that. So when people leave the dysautonomia program, they get a roadmap. And it gives you options. So you can actually choose. And I, I help you make that decision in there. Uh, 
what you want to do once you hit remission and for how long and where you move next and all of that. And there, there's kind of two approaches, a rabbit and a hare. I strongly, or a rabbit and a turtle. I strongly recommend the turtle approach. I was a turtle, right? I long after remission, I stayed on the same diet, did the same lifestyle things for years. Why would we mess with that? We've been through enough, right? Why even gamble? Some people though, and, and typically the ones that pop into remission very quickly, like in one to three months, those folks, uh, where it's just like very, very rapid, they're in remission. Sometimes if, just like with anything, if you haven't had to like carve out your soul to get it, you know, and really like grit and just like go down to bloody knuckles to get it, you don't always value you value it as much. And so it's typically the people that pop into remission very quickly and then start eating other foods or living other ways, like overworking or over drinking, uh, not being in ketosis, those kind of things. And so I always recommend that once you're in remission, you want to, uh, you want to mitigate your new life, right? If you have a big stress coming, let's say you're gonna be moving with your family and you're happy about it, or let's say a family member dies, you tighten up everything. You bring it back to what worked initially so that your body has all the strength it needs to get through that stress. Um, but it's very human and, and that's the only time I've seen it and it's, it's not been common where someone would slip out. Uh, but again, it's, it's from timing. Right. They clearly didn't do 24 months on the microbiome shifting diet or any of that. And it's it's understandable. I mean, who wouldn't who wouldn't do that? I would probably would have, too, if I could have. <laughs> it just wasn't an option. OK. Oh, that's a great question. OK. Do you feel that the no plant gaps diet can heal someone with MCAS or MCAT? I would add that as well. Yes, I see it all the time. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, carnivore, I used to only teach for, you know, it wasn't like a YouTube thing. It, it wasn't like a thing that people knew about. So I used to only teach it for schizophrenia. And it worked like magic for that. But because I started working with histamine conditions when I first started my practice, and I don't, I don't know that anyone else was at the time, because uh, I was getting people from all over the world. Uh, I was used to like, you know, paring things down. And there's lots of different approaches histamine disorders. I will tell you though, carnivore is the most simple. It's the most simple. It lets you eat higher histamine foods. It gives you more food flexibility. So uh, yeah, I've, I've seen many people go into four remission uh, with the carnivore version uh, with, with MCAS and MCAT as well. In fact, even uh, one of my nutritionists, uh, she, Jen, she was a patient of mine way back in the day, <laughs> like probably 10 years ago. And she had anaphylaxis to so many things. I'd have to pull up her chart as to how many to give you a specific number. She tested negative for those after doing uh, the protocol long enough. So, so absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Oh, oh, this is fun. Okay. Ray Pete. Do you guys know who Ray Pete is? <laughs> Ray Pete is a scientist from Eugene, Oregon, where I used to practice. And he's a bit of a recluse, actually. So he would say himself that he doesn't have a diet. But there are all these people online following his diet. <laughs> but what he does, he does research. And he's well known for his raw carrot salad. So when we eat raw carrots, which are great, they're allowed on this diet, by the way, once you can do the, the raw food, which is about five, five weeks in, if you do the gaps intro, it depends what protocol you do, but the, uh, it has soluble fiber. Now, soluble fiber is not like the fiber you get in cereal. Uh, there's insoluble and soluble. Soluble, we can't digest, but what soluble fiber does is it binds to fat soluble toxins. What is estrogen when it hasn't been processed through the body properly? a fat soluble toxin. It's gonna ping pong around the body like the Energizer Bunny, right? And cause all sorts of things depending on what receptors it goes to. The soluble fiber foods can be very beneficial for this in our modern day. They are not essential for health, really. We do not get sick without them. 
they can be strategically used and very beneficial. It's not just carrot though. Uh, and actually it doesn't have to be raw. It's also in broccoli, it's in onions and garlic and bone marrow, all sorts of things, but that really does work. Now, in terms of repeat, I will tell you, I'll tell you all a little secret I haven't shared with anyone. If I learn a new protocol, so, you know, I, I'm insatiably curious. I'm sure you guys can tell that. And uh, and I'm not too close-minded. So I like to try new things, even if I think they're crazy. I'll, I'll try them on myself. And then if they surprise me and they do something good, then I might recommend them. And of course, I learned about Ray Pete maybe 15 years ago. And Ray Pete recommends things that are a bit uh, different, right? Like you should take thyroid medicine, like everyone, almost. I'm, I'm exaggerating. Uh, lots and lots of milk. You should drink a lot of milk. You can have ice cream. Uh, there, there are certain things. So I jump in his Facebook group and I, I typically don't use Facebook, but I'll do it for the dietary group so I can monitor. And what I'm looking for when I'm curious about a protocol or a diet is not the science, right? What I'm looking for are the moods of the people. How are the reactions of the people? Are they resilient? Are they happy? Uh, if someone doesn't agree with them, do they get argumentative? What is it like? When I go into a GAPS group, and GAPS, of course, has a hundred different varieties, right? So there, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But when I go into a GAPS group, everyone is supportive. If someone says, ah, oh, you know, God, I tried this. It just did not work. I got to quit. I'm dipping out, guys. They'll get love and support. They won't get anger. Whereas in a repeat group, there is so much anger and reactivity, which tells me they're not making their nervous system uh, like the good chemicals, <laughs> right? Because when we have our good dopamine or serotonin, we're graceful. We're not accusatory. We're not reactive. So, so it tells me a lot. And so I've never been, I've, I'm very intrigued in his research, but the way that his diet is taught, no. Um, that said, I mean, do, do anything that works, you know, I mean, really, like who cares what it is? If it gets you under remission, do it and then let me know. Uh, that's important for us to know. Okay. Oh, I should finish answering that because you also asked about pro-metabolic diet. A person needs to be pretty healthy for a pro-metabolic a pro uh, metabolic diet. So if you have a very good uh, glucose resilience, so you can bounce in and out of ketosis, then that's appropriate. And you'll see a lot of athletes benefit from that. But, but you do have to be very metabolically healthy for that, which, which this group is not going to be. Uh, Luna, you're asking if autism is a type of dysautonomia. No, it's not. They're totally different. Uh, would a ketogenic diet help? Likely, yes. Uh, what I really see work the best for autism is, is the classic, very classic, a GAPS intro. Uh, that done for a very long time. Not going to full GAPS is very, very effective. Whether it's in ketosis or not, I haven't seen it matter with autism. But most autism cases now have comorbidities. So if there's more nervous system involvement in other areas, then yes. Yeah, absolutely. And typically there's a lot of digestive issues too. So it can benefit. Okay. I'm just going to do a couple more questions here. So I'm going to scan through. Johan is asking about restless leg syndrome. So uh, in my experience, most people with restless leg syndrome are, are lacking malic acid, malic acid. So we'll do uh, maybe like a jigsaw. Uh, always check, always check the extra ingredients, right? Because companies change the ingredients all the time. There could be starch, but uh, magnesium malate, with malic acid, you do three in the morning, three at night, uh, every day for six weeks, usually around six weeks, you see the difference, the pain comes down. But with that, very important to keep things like fruit down to maybe berries, right? You don't wanna be spiking your blood sugar when you have restless leg going on. That usually gets rid of it very quick. It's kind of a slam dunk. Okay. All right, carrots with candida. Great question. Mm -hmm. I would say candida is very misunderstood. We have 247 different fungi in our body, and most of them 
are beneficial. I really think the way we've approached uh, candida is very similar to the way we've approached bacteria with the kill approach. And I'm sure you're, you may even be one of these <laughs> poor folks, and if so, I'm so sorry, where you've just done an onslaught of reduction, right, plus kill, lots of kill. Like, I'll take this antifungal and this antifungal. Whereas the issue is really, we're lacking the good fungus. We need the good fungus. Or our body is using that candida, which is almost always the case in, in the types of folks that I see, right? So if you're dealing with nervous system disorders, if you're disabled, I'm talking to you with candida. Candida needs to be put on a shelf. You don't even think about it until you're close to remission because our body is pretty magical, as is nature. And candida, as I'm sure most of you know, it has to, it, it requires carbohydrates to eat and to pro proliferate, right? So it's, it makes sense. It's logical that if you have a lot of fungal overgrowth, you would stop eating carbs. Makes sense. I'm sure you all know that rarely works though, right? It very rarely works. One of the reasons for that is because our body will actually allow the DNA of the fungus to change when we're dealing with heavy metals or oxalates or parasites. Why? Because the fungus protects us from those things. So often when we have a lot of fungus, it's there to safeguard us. It's our angel, actually. It feels like the demon, but it's actually our angel. And so if we go and we try killing it and the killing approach doesn't work and the starvation approach doesn't work, that is because your body is using it. There are always those cases that are just a one-off, but you would know if you're in that camp because you'll reduce your carbs, you'll take an oil of oregano or garlic or whatever it is, or diflucan, and be fine and it won't come back. I'm not talking to those folks. Those folks like go enjoy your day. But for the rest of us, candida is, is very top tier. You know, when you're, when you have such a myriad condition where it's all over the body, you want to think of your body like a building, right? It, it, like a New York skyscraper. You have your foundation and you have your penthouse. Your penthouse is going to be built last, right? That's the last thing you deal with. That would be your candida. Candida, SIBO, those go up there because you want to get rid of the causes, right? If you get rid of the cause and you treat, it goes away. Uh, so you don't have to deal with that. Again, if you're a SIBO candida person, you're treating, 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 the cause is not being addressed. Okay. All right. Another person wants to have their uh, a doctor wants to remove a gallbladder. Totally up to you. I cannot tell you what to do. I will tell you if we can keep our organs, let's keep our organs. <laughs> Gallbladders are typically our friends. You know, if there's stones in there, the stones surround a parasite. Uh, so if you cut them open, there'll be a, a fraction of a parasite. It's a, a way to get rid of them in the body. But really, the, the reason why people are having difficulty with their gallbladders these days is because the dietary uh, recommendations of the 80s and the 90s, where we were told to reduce our fat intake. The gallbladder is like a muscle. If you stop, let's say, let's say you're an arm wrestler just with the right side, right? So you've got one strong arm, one weak one. That's your strong one. And you're working out every day and you're lifting weights and then you're, you're competing. And then something happens and you stop, let's say for like a year. Your muscle's gonna atrophy, right? And so if you go and you try to pick up the same weights or compete against the same people, it's not gonna be the same. Your gallbladder is the same. It atrophies with the current dietary recommendations. And so when people have a gallbladder attack, it's typically because they had a lot of carbs with a lot of fats, suddenly. The gallbladder is so savable. It's so savable. I, I haven't had, I mean, there's always gonna be a case, you know, so take this with a grain of salt, but I haven't had anyone have to lose their gallbladder. Very often there are deficiencies involved, such as uh, taurine, the amino acid taurine, I would always do uh, a good a good 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams of taurine if I had an issue with my gallbladder. And then vitamin C is actually important. It's one of the rare uh, times that I'll, I'll use vitamin C. Those two deficiencies can cause issues with the gallbladder. But more than that, I see it's the erratic eating 
that causes gallbladder issues. So it's the, I'm gonna have sushi today and a Caesar salad tomorrow. And today I'm having this. That is not typical for humans ever in human history and not in most of the world. They're eating the same thing at the same time every day. The gallbladder knows exactly what to do. And so it's really more ideal to address the, the problems underneath it because you want, you want your gallbladder, your bile is incredibly important incredibly. I mean, the body recycles 95% of it for a reason. That that bile is gold. You need it. That, that removes those fat-soluble toxins that we can artificially bring in soluble fiber from carrots for, but you don't have to. Um, that can be really great. So I, I would try to keep it if you can. But I, I wouldn't just artificially keep it, you know, I, meaning that I wouldn't just say, I'm going to keep my gallbladder and not do anything. It, it's very important to, to do things to support it. And supporting it does not mean eliminating fat, actually. It's in very slowly increasing it. So whether I have someone that had a gallbladder removed before we work together, or let's say you get it out right now, or you wanna you wanna try to save it, right? So you're doing the, the taurine, you're doing the vitamin C, all those things. One of the things you can do is every week, slowly increase your fat. So, so this is where the measurement really comes in. You could do half a teaspoon if you need, of butter or whatever you tolerate, okay? Uh, it could be tallow, what you like. Next week, it's one teaspoon additional fat at your meal, just one meal, right? And you slowly go up. That trains the body and, and the body can say, oh, okay, she wants to eat more fat. I will produce more lipase to break that down and more, uh, more bile and all these things. So you want to think about every action you do with reverence and with consistency and with strategy, right? So very strategically increase it. Okay. Uh, Derek, you're asking about if it can present, if dysautonomia can be mild in some people. Yes, yes, some people have it very mild. I'm sure it doesn't feel mild to them. But, you know, th those that have been disabled, it's very mild. Like, they can walk about. They might even be able to go running. Uh, they can work. They are much more tired than the others. And there's no guarantee that they'll they'll stay that way either. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you have been humbled enough through the years. It really varies through the years. So someone could start mild and go quite severe. Um, but, but they do exist. They do exist. Uh, Blue Sky, I really wish that uh, the doctors understood dysautonomia too. I'm really working on that. I speak at as many medical conferences as I can. Uh, and that's part of why I do the podcast and the other things and the practitioner training. Um, yes, same with Lyme as well. Ariel, so, uh, severe depression. Okay, so severe depression and can't just start being positive and grateful. Of course you can't. Yeah. No, don't. <laughs> that's that's good. Work on physical things. Work on getting your posture right, right? And if you're too weak, if you're disabled, because I don't know if you're disabled or not. If you're disabled and you can't sit up like I am now, then you lay down flat on the bed. If our spine and our chin are all in alignment and erect, we will make a lot of serotonin. There are many things that we need to do to get it going, though. So getting light in the eyes is very important. I, I always buy the, don't hold me to this. I don't know if I can keep doing it, but I always buy the feel bright, the feel bright light from Amazon. It's this little clip on light that you put on a visor. It's a circadian light uh, for anyone who goes through my dysautonomia program. And it's because you can do it from bed, right? You clip that on. That's going to stimulate your serotonin. That's really, really good. If you're not on medication, things like St. John's wort are Wonderful. I love it, but don't, I never recommend it with an SSRI. You can get serotonin, serotonin uh, issues with that. But what I would recommend, typically, when we're depressed or when we're very sick or when just everything is awful, gratitude will sound trite. But I don't want trite. You don't want trite. You need to look at different things, right? So, uh, I had to play a lot of mind tricks on myself and, and you might need to do the same too. 
Don't think about the whole picture and your whole life. Don't go big, go tiny, go micro. Think about your thumbnail. Imagine, really sit down, close your eyes and imagine not having a thumbnail, how much that would affect you. You couldn't open anything that came in a can. There's all sorts of ways it can affect you. Go micro, go micro. I don't, I don't want you to Pollyanna it. I'm never a fan of being dishonest ever with yourself or others. Integrity is very important, but you can be honest in the same situation. And if you look at a different thing, you can see something good. So you don't have to look at what's bad and make it good. You can make that neutral. Neutral is great. Uh, look at something else that maybe the attention hasn't gone to. That can be really helpful. Uh, with depression, you know, depending on if it's severe or casual, we'd want to look at socials. Uh, so if you're not disabled, socials are very important. We are not meant to be alone. Uh, so we really need contact and all of that. But microbiome shifting, it, general gaps, not even ketosis is needed for that, can help you start making those feel-good chemicals out of your gut. But don't, don't underplay light. You really need daylight in your eyes significantly. And cold therapy could be helpful too. Okay. Oh, guys, my teeth? My teeth? Okay. Listen, I'm so sorry. I have no advice for the teeth. These are... I. My grandpa, my whole family has these that forever. I'm so sorry. They were from birth. <laughs> There's nothing I can tell you for that. I will say, though, oil pulling. I have seen oil pulling make people's teeth really beautiful, really beautiful. And your breathing actually changes your face structure and your jaw. If you all have not looked into jaw structure and breathing, do it. it it's directly related to the nervous system, your nitric oxide production, all of that. And for those of you, since we're in this area, dealing with sinus congestion and allergies, make sure you, you're using something. It could be the back of a spoon. You don't have to go and buy something. But they have those gua sha's, the like rose quartz or the jade stones that you can massage with. You have a lot of lymph here. And when you clean out the lymph, that's, that's very helpful. You can also do things like Elsakai. Okay, we're gonna do one more question. Oh, that's a big one, but it's probably important. Okay. Okay, two, goose girl. For MS, keto. Yeah, carnivore only if the person wants it, so carnivore keto, but keto is what's important. And and low leptin is very important, no tomatoes, none of that stuff. The And high B1. Okay, so I saw a big question that I think we should answer. Give me a second. Adrenals and thyroid struggling. Okay. So thyroid disease is a dime a dozen these days. You can throw a rock and hit someone with it, but it, it's very common with dysautonomia. I personally had two autoimmune versions. I had Graves and Hashimoto's. Graves was way worse. <laughs> Graves is the, the hyper. And typically you would have your thyroid removed. And they did want to do that with me. I just had gotten to a point where I'd learned enough uh, to where <laughs> maybe I was dangerous. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I just said no <laughs> and and worked at what I could do and ended up reversing it. So I, I was very lucky. Um, I don't know if I'd advise that, but I was very lucky. The the thyroid, we often want to look at directly. And for, for some people, that will work. There are about five different nutrients that if you're deficient in uh, hypothyroidism or hyper are likely. So you can just address those through supplementation. But typically, the issue is much higher or lower up. It's really in the pituitary or in the liver. The liver's got to clear our hormones through phase two, phase three detox channels. And so uh, typically, it's not direct that you would go for the thyroid. Now, my thyroid reversed uh, and healed in ketosis. And I have seen thousands of people do that. There's even books on it. One of the reasons it can be so effective is that the thyroid has to work like a hummingbird when you're on a glucose burning diet. Now a hummingbird, just like our digestion earlier, if you're snacking, it's constantly busy. So it can't repair. We want these things to regenerate. And so we wanna relax it. 
ketosis is relaxing for it. It doesn't need to produce as many hormones. In fact, you'll test low for T3. You're really not low. You're just in ketosis. If you were high, that would be abnormal or normal. That would be abnormal. So, so hormone levels and things are different in ketosis. And unfortunately, much of the medical community is not familiar with this, but it is very well documented in, in medical literature. So it's not, it's not guessing or assuming. Uh, I don't see things like adrenal issues really be an issue at all. Uh, I'll expand that. The adrenal glands are these tiny little beans that are above the kidney. And if we were to put, let's say we take a monkey. I mean, this would be terrible. Don't do this. But you take a monkey, give it anesthetics, put it to sleep. Surgeon goes in, carves out the adrenal gland. That adrenal gland will regrow within 24 days, 24 hours. 24 hours, you have a new one. The adrenal glands are incredibly resilient. The, the issue is almost never the adrenal gland, just like it's not truly the thyroid. It's deeper. It's much deeper. And so you have to look at what's going on there. And that's the nervous system. So things that feel like a struggle often are not. And, and one thing to always remember is that many things that make us feel better are not good for us, right? Think of an alcoholic who has a drink in the morning. Do they feel better? Absolutely. Many healthy people, healthy in our population, are constantly doing lots of things that are bad for them but make them feel good. It's no difference. There's no different. Uh, it's no difference with illness either. Okay, guys. This has been wonderful. We have lots of questions, so maybe we'll have a way to copy these and we can do them for the next one. It's been really fun. Thank you for showing up. Uh, this has been great. Let me know anything in the comment section below or in the, in the chat below, and I'll try to address it when I can. But really great questions uh, and very fun. So I hope you guys can take some of this information. Just know whatever road you go on, unless you're one of the rare lucky ones, it's, it's a long and it's a hard road. So work on internal grit with kindness, like a lot. Like it's like a soft grit, okay? Not forcing. Uh, it's not a force, it's a strategy. A strategy to your day, to your diet, to your thoughts, all of it.